of look and the act of the and the act of the apostle. I'm sending upon you what my father promised, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, respectively. In the Gospel of John, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. This mission mandate is not limited to the first century disciples, but applied to Christians of all ages. In this presentation, proposal of ways for proclaiming the good news in the digital age, I explore dialogue as one of various methods for fulfilling the mission mandate in the world of the digital age. By examining the concept of evangelization to dialogue as proposed by the church in the encyclical Ecclesia Suam, I propose and discuss five essential dialogue in today's context, that is the digital age, the current context in the world that has been digitalizing. The faithful can proclaim the good news by dialogue with religion, dialogue with culture, dialogue with the poor, dialogue with ecology, and dialogue with the digital age. Dialogue as way of proclaiming Jesus. A new con the new context of the digital age. One global village. Before the digital age, people were significantly less connected, both nationally and internationally. Many individuals primarily remain within their local towns and surrounding areas for their entire lives with limited awareness of neighboring countries, often only in gaining knowledge to school classes. Physical travel to those neighboring countries was a rare opportunity. However, with the advent of the digital age, the world has undergone a profound transformation. Characterized by the widespread avail availability of the internet and digital technologies, people across the globe now can connect and communicate instantly to various social media platforms. Event happening in places like Papua New Guinea can be broadcast globally in real time to personal devices. Similarly, live video, live video clips of recent earthquakes in Morocco can be globally circulated through social media. This interconnectedness has effectively transformed the world into a global village where information of all kinds can be shared and disseminated instantly. In the digital age, traditional barriers of space and time have been diminished. To travel, culture, religion, as the impact of the global village. Furthermore, digital technologies have created new opportunities for travel. Popular tourist destinations and historically significant cities around the world are now 
frequented daily by tourists from diverse corners of the globe. Additionally, the vivid availability of transportation have made first world countries become attractive destinations for migrants seeking improved financial prospects for their own families. Taiwan and South Korea, for instance, have become destination for many Vietnamese migrants. And Filipinos are often considered the leading group of migrants in remote areas like Central Australia, Filipino can be found filling roles as teachers and nurses in upper regional schools and hospitals, respectively. In addition, the presence of Muslim in North America and Europe, where Christianity remains the majority religion underscores the coexistence of individuals from different faith in this global village. Moreover, the popularity of digital devices like smartphones has made access to vast knowledge available on digital platforms a ubiquitous part of daily life. With just a few clicks, individuals can access information concerning events, cultures, news, religions, music, and art from different areas, different nations. This phenomenon not only bridges geographical and cultural gaps, but also enables the citizens of the global village to gain knowledge about the broader world and appreciate the diversity of religious belief. In this newly depicted global village, the context of eventualization has also evolved. Consequently, eventualization in the digital age must embrace new ways of preaching the good news. This means the faithful of the digital age can fulfill their mission mandate by engaging in dialogues with religion, culture, the impoverished population affected by migration, environmental concerns related to climate change, and the opportunities provided by the digital age. We now go to dialogue observation. Pope Paul VI in the encyclical Ecclesiam Suam, paragraph 70, introduced, introduced the term dialogue of salvation in reference to the mission mandate. He affirmed that salvation history is itself a dialogue of God with humanity in various forms. Throughout this history, that dialogue with humankind through the logos had revealed the Trinity's love for humanity. Also attended the paragraph two of Second Vatican II highlights the very first dialogue in salvation history among the Trinity, meaning among the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at the source of God's unconditional love for humanity. This dialogue led to the creation of the universe and humanity. The dialogue of salvation continued with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, extended to Noah and Abraham, even during the time of enslavement in Egypt, that engaged in dialogue with Moses. And in the promised land, the dialogue of salvation continued to the figures of churches, prophets, 
kings saw David, Solomon. And, also, and finally, which is climax with the birth of Jesus Christ in the city of Bethlehem. The letter to the Hebrew therefore declares, I quote, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors, to the prophets, as many times in various ways, but in these last days, God has spoken to us by the Son. And now we go to the dialogue with religion. One, Nostra Atete. The Declaration Nostra Atete of Second Vatican Council acknowledges the presence of various religions in the world. Four of them are mentioned in the document Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism. In this context, the document recognizes race of truth outside of the Catholic Church. And one of the foot of Notre Atete is the call for Christians to engage in dialogue with adherents of other religions and actually engaging with members of different faith has been carried out by Jesus, the first missionary in salvation history as recorded in the Johannan Gospel and recently by Pope Francis during his pastoral visit in Iraq. Second, Jesus at the well. A prominent example of Jesus' interfaith dialogue is the dialogue at the well of Jacob with a Samaritan woman. To the dialogue at the well, Jesus helped the Samaritan woman recognize him as the Messiah. Furthermore, he guided her to understand that worship is not confined to a physical place, but rather worship is in spirit and truth. And after this dialogue, the Samaritan woman left her water jar at the well and went back to her village. She then introduced Jesus to her fellow villagers. To her testimony, the villager came to the well, encountered Jesus, and became his disciples. During his visit to Iraq in 2021, Pope Francis engaged in dialogue with religion, with followers of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. In the ancient city of U, Pope Francis mentioned Abraham, the common ancestor of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In his speech to members of these three religions, the Pope referred to the star in the sky that got compared to Abraham's descendant. The Pope reminded the adherents of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam that they are indeed the stars mentioned in the dialogue between God and Abraham. And now we go to D dialogue with culture. The first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. At the beginning of the Christian era, while preaching the gospel to people of different culture in the Roman Empire, the church approached evangelizing to dialogue with culture. That's why Paul's state said to the Jews, I become like a Jew to those not having the law. I became like one not having the law. Dialogue with culture help individuals from a particular culture recognize that Jesus Christ and the gospel 
have incarnated within their own culture. On the other hand, it's more easily for people of this particular culture embrace the gospel into their hearts. If they notice Jesus and his gospel, just like local, local person like them. On the other hand, if the local experience the gospel as a foreign product or even worse, offending their own religion, <clears throat> persecution would be a sour food that one would receive. The persecution in Vietnam for nearly three centuries, I repeat, for nearly three centuries, is a concrete example for this case. We go to the persecution of Christians in Vietnam. Vietnamese history records the arrival of Jesus missionaries in 1615, marking the emergence of Catholicism in Vietnam. According to Alexander the Road, around 300,000 people were baptized in Northern Vietnam by 1650. So only about 35 years later, you can see a big number who received baptism. The young Vietnamese just quickly reap a bountiful harvest. However, it soon also faced deep persecution for its faith in Jesus Christ. The Catholic martyrdom in Vietnam took various forms over nearly three centuries, from 1625 to 1860. The persistence of anti-Christian approaches in Vietnam for almost three centuries poses questions for religious and historical scholars. That is, why? Well, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism were welcomed and integrated into the Vietnamese culture. This phenomenon did not happen with Christianity. Moreover, More, moreover, Christianity in Vietnam, the history was labeled as a false, F-A-L-S-E, a false religion by the Vietnamese kings. The history of the Vietnamese recorded, I quote, during the reign of King Lee, a Westerner named Ignatius secretly entered North Vietnam promoting the false religion. This term false religion was even scarred on faces of Vietnamese Christian prisoners. You can see the picture I have tagged to the PowerPoint. But why? Why was Christianity branded as a false religion by Vietnamese leaders and kings. One of the significant reasons leading to the phenomenon of Christianity becoming a false religion is connected to Vietnamese filial piety, meaning ancestor veneration. That is the core Christian belief in the worship of one God created a profound conflict with the core value of ancestor veneration in Vietnamese culture. Who he peaceed against Vietnamese faithful participating in and practicing ancestor veneration, I quote, created a gap between the gospel and the Vietnamese culture, unquote. The first funding job, Peter Fan, concluded 
acquitted him. The condemnation of ancestor veneration was a tragic mistake and the disaster for the church in Vietnam because it was seen as a foreign religion that prohibited what was most sacred and religious in Vietnam. And now we go to the dialogue of, with the poor. <clears throat> One Jesus, a fan of the poor, in Jewish society, the poor were a priority priority for Jesus. Though uh, those afflicted with leprosy, disabilities, are marginalized by society, were the concerns of Jesus. Jesus healed ten lepers in the outskirts, restored sight to a man born blind by applying mud to his eyes and instructing him to wash in the pool in the Gospel of John chapter 9. And he prompted Zacchaeus, a famous tax collector, to invite him for dinner from Luke chapter 19. Those afflicted with leprosy, disabilities, or put to the edge of Jewish society were the poor. Simply put, they were socially categorized as second class citizens in Jewish society. Because Jesus is a fan of the poor, the church founded by Jesus must also be the church of the poor. Despite significant economic progress in recent decades, Asia remained home to nearly half of the world's poorest people. Asia has the large number of people living in poverty, defined as surviving on 1.9 US dollars per day. Even, even the multicultural, multi-religious, and unique economic life in Asia, the Federation of the Asian Bishops Conferences, FABC, proposed during their meeting in Taipei on April 27, 1974, a highly effective method of evangelizing in Asia called the Triple Dialogue, and one of them is Dialogue with the Poor. I go to F, Dialogue with Ecology. Mark 16, 15, and John 3, 16. In a conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus made it clear why the Son of God has incarnated. It was because the Father loved the world so much that he sent his Son to save the world. Before ascending to heaven, the reason Jesus instructed his disciples, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation, Mark 16, 15. In the original text of John 3, 16, the evangelist employed the term Cosmos, meaning the world as universe. The evangelist did not stop at verse 16, but repeated the same concept in the next verse. I quote, for God did not send God only son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through the logos. Simply put, the evangelist confirmed once again that the world is the object for which God sent the Son to become human. The remarkable aspect of verses 16 and 17 is that God loves humans and God desires to redeem them. And because God, because of God's love for the world, God desires to redeem the world. The world does not obviously include only humans but also many creatures and plants. And now we go to the example of this category, Dialogue with Ecology, and I use the Aboriginal way of life as an example. 
Admit the threat from climate change, the Aboriginal wisdom I am because we are, and the model of respecting all forms of creation have surfaced to greater attention. The Australian Aborigines teach their children not to harvest all food on the tree, not to destroy plants, forests, hills, mountains for one's benefit not to hunt kangaroos and other animals as sport, but respect the integrity of all animals, plants, and their habitats. In the north of the Northern Territory, where there are plenty of crocodiles living in the rivers, the Aborigines teach their children not to enter the rivers. Why? Because they should respect the crocodile territory. Living with this ecological mindset has enabled the Aborigines to survive in Australia for 40,000 years. Moreover, the wisdom confirmed the theology that God does not create only humanity, plants, animals, birds, fish, ants, bees, insects, are all neighbors of human being. If we human do not respect their neighbor's life, this can result in the extinction of the human race itself. And now I go to the last dialogue of my talk, and this is the dialogue with the digital age. One, the fear and Aeropagus in Mark chapter four, and Acts chapter 17. Jesus, as a very first missionary in salvation history, in his, in his own context and Jewish way, depicted the missionary image of God as a soul who goes to the field for sowing the seed. The seed from his hand falling to the different areas of the field. The one fell on the good soil produces the crop of a 30, 60, and 104. In addition, according to the Acts of the Apostles, during his second mission journey, the Apostle Paul made a significant stop at the Aeropagus in the city of Athens. Here, Paul immersed himself in the lively debate on topic of religion. As he engaged with the local elite, gathered at the Aeropagus. Paul delivered a profile proposal, that is, the deity they worship at the unknown God were in truth none other than the Abba, the Lord, who raised Jesus from the dead. Now we go to the social online platform and I call, they are the new field and Aeropagus. In the midst of the digital age, the field in the Markan parable and the Aeropagus are undoubtedly represented by various social media platforms. Currently, people worldwide spend an average of 151 minutes engaging with this digital platform daily, nearly three hours per day. Similarly, broadband search observed that people in the global village spend 147 minutes, almost two and a half hours daily on social media platforms. South American lead this average time with a statistic of three hours and 24 minutes, followed by Americans with three hours and 10 minutes, Asian Oceanians with two hours and 16 minutes, North Americans with two hours and six minutes, and Europeans with one hour and 15 minutes. When 
considering the seven most popular social, social media platform, Facebook lead with an average of 33 minutes a user spends on per day, followed by TikTok at 32 minutes, Twitter and Snapchat sharing the same figure, 31 minutes, Instagram with 29 minutes, WhatsApp with 28 minutes, and YouTube with 19 minutes. And Bell Wong asserted that about 4.9 billion people of the world's 8 billion population use social media in 2023 so far. On, the, on average, users tend to engage with six or seven online platforms monthly. Researchers indicate that in the early years, people use social online for communication. However, individuals of all ages turn to online forums for matters related to business, politics, dating. These statistics, these Statistics firmly point to the realities of the market field and Europeus of the digital age, where people from the global village come together every day for being connected. These platforms, when viewed through the lens of evangelization, can be likened to a contemporary field and Europeus, where individuals of diverse backgrounds ages, cultures, and religion or faith gather to exchange thoughts and contemplation questions about life and spirituality. In this evolving landscape, the new field and the new Europeans, it is imperative for the church to have a visible presence. Simply put, the church means us in the contemporary world must engage in dialogue with the digital age in the new market field and Europeans. The church become an active participation in discussions, offering reflections, providing answers, and posing to provoking questions, all from the perspective of revolving around Jesus and his good news. I come to the conclusion. In conclusion, the prominent way for the faithful of the digital age to preach the good news is through dialogue, reflecting the ongoing dialogue within the Trinity since the beginning of creation. Thanks to the technologies provided by the digital age, the world has now transformed into a global village, a new context of evangelization. In this village, people of different faiths and cultures coexist as neighbors. Thus, the church recommends the faithful to engage in the triple dialogue, dialogue with religion, dialogue with culture, dialogue with the poor. Additionally, due to the threat of climate change, the church also urges the faithful to engage in dialogue with ecology. And since the context of our world has shifted to a digital age, we, the faithful, are invited to enter this new market field and Europeans to share the good news with the citizens of the digital age. That's all I have. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Thank you, Michael, for that wonderful presentation. The paper has almost taken us more than half an hour. 
uh, as we have listened to Michael. Let's just take a few minutes to ponder on what Michael has shared with us. And if you have any questions coming up, feel free to put those questions in the chat and then we will engage. It's lovely to see more than 20, 24 of you uh, participating in the webinar. I will just make a few reflections as, as a way of responding to uh, what Michael has shared. I just let's let's take a few few minutes in silence. That's a good question from Yon, which has come up in the chat. But feel free to put in your own question and query that you have from Michael's presentation. Uh, in a few moments, I will make my own response to Michael's paper. Proposal of ways for proclaiming the good news in the digital age. I just want to make a few comments on Michael's paper for this evening. Among us as Catholics, there's a good deal of confusion, I believe, that exists between the two words, mission and evangelization. Although sometimes used interchangeably, they are not exactly the same. Mission belongs to God in the first instance, and hence we speak of God's mission or Monsieur Dei. Evangelization, on the other hand, refers to the efforts which are made by the church to effect God's mission. God sent Jesus into the world to bring the good news of God's love and saving intentions and to invite people, all people, into relationship with God. And so the community for mission, the church, continues Jesus' work and so has the mission to evangelize. That is to bring the good news just as Jesus did and to offer a witness of life to the truths that it proclaims. And to accomplish this mission, it has to enter into a dialogue with people so that they can understand both what is proclaimed and the meaning of their witness of life. And so the three activities, just as, as Michael has mentioned to us, proclamation, witness, and dialogue, they are all the most and the important three fundamental modes of doing mission today. So I want to make a distinction between the three fundamental elements or modes of mission, namely proclamation, which is by word, life witness, and dialogue. These are the three modes of mission. And then we can have different forms of mission, such as liturgy, prayer, pastoral ministry, efforts to promote integral human development, efforts to effect liberation, reconciliation among people, efforts to promote peace and justice, inculturation, care for the earth, interreligious dialogue, so on and so forth. 
So what has become clear today in the, this evening's presentation by Michael is in recent decades is that the fundamental modality of mission, which was known traditionally as proclamation by word and witness, needs to be complemented by a second modality that is dialogue. And I think Michael, Michael deserves a, a, a good applaud from all of us by the way he has explained how dialogue is making ways and continues to be relevant even today and more especially today in the digital world or the digital age. So dialogue is finding its rightful place in mission. There's no other way that we can do mission today without dialogue, eng engaging in dialogue. And we need to continuously rediscover the significance of how Jesus went about doing his mission. And a wonderful example that Michael gave us to this evening is Jesus who met the woman at the well in John chapter four. He respected the dignity and the integrity of his hearers, acknowledging and giving effect to the fact that God's spirit is present in each and human, each and every human being of goodwill. And so the dialogue recorded in the gospel of John illustrates as Michael spoke to us brilliantly tonight, that this modality of action is relevant today. None is more well known, more widely than the dialogue that happened between Jesus and the woman at the well. Engaging with others in dialogue does not aim to change their religion. It is about better understanding, a deeper spirituality, and more peaceful living. Successful dialogue results in a conversation in a conversion of heart on the part of all the participants involved and leads to a deep in, deepening of their relationship with God. While mission can and does take many forms, all forms of authentic mission have three interrelated facets, namely a witness of life that validates what is being proclaimed, dialogue with the people to whom the message is proclaimed, and to whom some form of service is being offered. So in brief, proclamation by word and by witness and dialogue are the three essential fundamental modes of mission. Dialogue as the mode of mission. In the era of missions, the emphasis in missionary activity, both Catholic and Protestant, was on the first two elements. European missionaries were rarely trained in the language of the people to whom they were sent. So meaningful dialogue with them was not possible. Most European missionaries failed to understand the cultural framework within the local peoples, thought and acted. European missionaries often judged the local cultures to be inferior to their own. And so at least in their view, the onus was on local peoples to learn the language of the Europeans. And so the problem of language and its relationship to understanding other cultures was not only a problem for missionaries, but it was also a problem faced by the pioneers in the field of anthropology. And so the latter often lived with remote places, observed their customs and behaviors, but rarely they mastered their language. On returning to civilization, they wrote extensive reports about native cultures. Critique of this early work revealed was the many pioneering anthropologists unthinkingly interpreted other cultures using criteria that was developed within their own Western culture. And so it took well into the 20th century for missionaries and anthropologists to understand that a society's culture provides peoples living in that culture with a default frame of reference and that they deploy, employ to make sense of life. And this is the true, this is as true for the Europeans as it was for the local peoples because missionaries and anthropologists did not realize that this was the case. Much of the work done in missions was then ineffective and often resulted in quite shallow evangelization. 
It was not until the post-Vatican II era that the study of anthropology and the respect for local cultures became an integral part for missionary formation and practice. To be effective in mission in a cross-cultural situation, it is necessary to achieve two goals. A missionary must understand the influence that his or her culture has on how he or she interprets the message of Jesus and the practices of the church. A missionary must also understand the frame of reference that local peoples use in making sense of their lives. Only when these two matters have been addressed, it is possible to enter in meaningful dialogue with local people. And this is not just a historical issue. It is the situation which is faced by many clergy from Africa, India, and Vietnam, and who are now even ministering in Australia. One of the problems with centralizing power in Rome in the 19th and 20th centuries was that the Roman way provided the architect archetype in church, in church practice. And this made it difficult for missionaries to contextualize Christian faith for local peoples, even after this became official church teaching. And so I want to go back to the beautiful message that uh, Pope Francis has given us this Mission Sundays, this Mission Sunday. Fire in the heart, feet on the move. He says, Christians have a duty to announce the gospel without excluding anyone not as one who imposes a new obligation, but as one who shares a joy, signals a beautiful horizon, offers a desirable banquet. And so missionary conversion remains the principal goal that we must set for ourselves as individuals and as a community, because missionary outreach is paradigmatic for all the church's activity. And this is, this is something beautiful that he speaks in Evangelii Gaudium number 50. And so the urgency of the church's missionary activity naturally calls for an ever closer missionary cooperation on the part of all her members and at every level. This is the essential goal of the synodal journey that the church has undertaken guided by the key words, communion, participation, and mission. This journey is certainly not a turning of the church in upon herself, nor is it a referendum about what we ought to believe and practice, nor a matter of human preferences. Rather, it is a process of setting out on a way, and like the disciples on the way to Emmaus, listening to the risen Lord. For he always comes among us to explain the meaning of the scriptures and to break the bread for us so that we can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, carry out his mission in the world today in different contexts. So hearts on the fire, feet on the moon. And so just as the two disciples of the way to Emmaus, the others had taken place along the way so to our proclamation will be a joyful telling of Christ the Lord, his life, his passion, his death and resurrection, and the wonders that his love has accomplished in our lives. And so he says, let us set out once more, illumined by our encounter with the risen Lord and prompted by his spirit. Let us set, us, set out again with burning hearts, with our eyes open and with our feet in motion. Let us set out to make others' hearts burn with the word of God, to open the eyes of others to Jesus in the Eucharist, and to invite everyone to walk together on the path of peace and salvation that God in Christ has bestowed upon all humanity. And may Our Lady of the Way, Mother of Christ, missionary disciples, and Queen of Missions, pray for us.
Thank you, Michael, for that wonderful, brilliant presentation that you gave us. And it's time for us to uh, put you, maybe engage in a bit of discussion at the moment, okay? If I can. All right. Uh, so let us go with the, let's go with the question from, from one of our formators here, or the Yon. Okay, he says, with the theme of our upcoming general chapter, 19th general chapter, an exit uh, in June, to become creative and faithful disciples, based on your proposal, can you give us some fresh and practical ideas on both the opportunities and challenges of being creative and faithful disciples in the new Aeropegus of digital age, especially in the context of our SVD formation? How do you prepare, how do we prepare our seminarians our future SVDs to be creative and faithful missionaries in the digital age. Or in the other words, we have the motto formation for mission. How do you perceive it in the context of formation for mission in the digital age? Michael, you want to respond to that? Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Yon. Uh, I know Father uh, Yon from uh, Central Australia. Anyway, in responding to your concern or your question about formation, formation in the digital age, you can see it again, uh, the formation before the digital age, they don't have uh, smartphones. The students, seminarians, they have no access to uh, the social online platforms. Uh, so, but now, that's a reality of daily life. I presented all the statistics about how people often, how often they go to social platform. So you can see, we cannot say no to the students of uh, the seminarians not using the smartphone because you see, we, instead of forbidding them not to you or have access to social internet. We can train them to use social media platform for proclaiming or for evangelizing. So you can see that's the way we now form formulating seminarians in the digital age. That's something very just like we eating um, uh, three meals a day. And so now if we say, no to the students who cannot have access to the digital, to the internet, to the social platform. You cannot have the smartphone, especially from Australia, where I believe is a reality of life, almost individual. Everyone, I believe they have Yes, 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 they do. They do, my As a formative product. Yes. Can you hear? But but again, I think as you say, I think um, proper say, education, okay. proper education you, on the subject. You know, yeah. oh, oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, your your signal is a okay. little bit up and down, but we can still hear. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. Does, that, does that answer your question, Yon? You want to make a? You want to make your? Maybe perhaps like, uh, of course, the opportunity is there. You know, they have their own smartphone and the signal Wi-Fi is super fast. So what could be the challenges, you know, like if you can see the challenges that can kind of like how to navigate it, you know, because the opportunity is there. And we talk about like, mission like conversion we are also to be converted by the digital age as well you know some many challenges that we can face if you can give us some like on that mm. all right so as you can see as we I continue with my proposal you can see you, there's no way for you to say no to the students in your formation that you cannot use smartphone or have access to internet, but to formulate them how to use smartphone or how to have access to internet for proclaiming the good news. You see, so the objective for the 
have access to the internet for the for, for student information is that not for your own interest, but formulating them a habit to use internet, to use smartphones as ways or tools for proclaiming the good news. So as you can see in that case, if they have Facebook accounts, uh, uh, TikTok, they can't, they can't. That, that's in the reality of today, today's context, but encourage them using those social platform for proclaiming that I can think about how to respond to your your question. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Thank you for that. And if I can also add to that, Michael, uh, it, it's a beautiful in the message of World Mission Sunday for this year. Pope Francis also mentioned mission. Many times we we take it upon ourselves that it is mission means it is our work, you know, but it is not. It is God's work. You know, first and foremost. And so we are called to be listening and discerning and listening to the Holy Spirit, what God wants us to be. So sometimes the, the social media platforms and all it becomes, everything becomes my followers uh, who are attracted to what I am doing. You know? But it should be the other way around. It is about proclaiming Christ. So proclamation, witness and dialogue. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, please keep your, there's another beautiful question coming up from Anthony. Anthony, would you like to address that question yourself to Michael? Anthony, Hello. His microphone not working. Oh, my mic is not working. Okay. Uh, okay. The, the, the question from Michael is, as someone who is working in PNG, which has relatively lower access to digital technology than other countries in the world. How do you perceive the dialogue involving digital technology in context where the digital divide between the haves and the have nots is still there? All right. Somebody talking? All right. Uh, in responding to Anthony's question. And uh, Anthony, you are right. Well, you see the reality that I, I had to uh, make a, a travel for one hour from a, a very re a remote area to a town where we can have access or a strong signal uh, indicating that uh, in PNG, uh, uh, in compared to uh, like the US, Australia, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, the internet here is, uh, we cannot compare to you guys. However, still digital uh, or internet are still uh, um, a reality here. So you can see still we have uh, internet and smartphone and uh, people, for example, like here I am now in uh, Mount Hagen, uh, Tau, a city in uh, PNG on the highlands still the people using the digital, uh, the internet for commu communication, not strong or fast or stable like, like you from the first world country, uh, but still the digital is still a reality here. So we still uh, can proclaim the good news to the new uh, market field and uh, new Arapagos. On the other hand, having said so, on the other hand, we, we can also see that this is about PNG. I have been living in PNG and working in PNG for 10, 10 months. So you can see a uh, well, well, little bit uh, uh, about PNG. You can see PNG people, if they don't have uh, access, they don't have the internet like us, they go to the public market. Uh, in the public market, you can see almost everywhere, the people get together. So in those areas, very often, I see uh, the picture from a different uh, Christian denomination. They stand in the public market, and they proclaim the good news. Uh, so in short, yes, PNG, we cannot compare to you guys in the first world country, but still the digital uh, is, is also a real reality in PNG.
Yeah. Since there is no question coming up, there's another question from my side, Michael. Uh, just, yes. Just to brief, just briefly speak upon what Jan was mentioning some time ago about the formation and some of the challenges in formation today. Um, now, as you know, the artificial intelligence came into existence from, I think, 1960s, as I was reading the book. Uh, Earlier, when the computer started, it was just about it was just about me and my computer in front of me, you know, and that was the relationship. Sometimes we would say that you put your you you type in information and you receive that information back to you. So it was the relationship between you and the computer. But today, everything has changed in twenty twenty three. Today, it is not just about me and my computer, but me and the social media and the network that is uh, that is connected uh, to the computers. Uh, so how do you deal with this uh, uh, this anonymity? At, people time, at the same time, they are connected to one another. At the same time, in the digital era, in the digital media, people are also remaining anonymous to one another. You know, so there is a lot of duplicity. You put in a different face in front of the, in your Facebook profiles maybe, and then you remain anonymous on the other side. But there is no genuine relationship of face-to-face. -face. People are scared today to have a face-to-face -face interaction with one another. People are more happy to texting from one room to another than meeting the person face-to-face. Those are some of the challenges that I'm just picking up from uh, the challenges of the digital age. How would you respond to that, Michael? Thank you. Again, uh, Abano, I, I think uh, I have, or we, in this case, I said, we have to be very clear with our mission, um, I mean, eventualization, that we, we must, and this is a must, a mandate, we must proclaim the good news in the digital age. And you can see, so in this case, we're not talking about having social contact with people on the digital age, but we are talking about I as a person going to the uh, the new market field, going to the new Arapagos, and I proclaim the good news to those people. So maybe I don't have a face, I don't have an identity, but still the content of my message is very clear. I proclaim the Jesus Christ. I proclaim what like Paul said. I proclaim the crucified Christ. And that's it, the text. That's it, the message I want to send to our audience. And of course, if you go to the uh, social, uh, social, social, social online platform for something else uh, without having face, your face, faces or identity, it's okay, that's your choice. But when I go to the social uh, media, I go with a face as uh, Michael Nguyen SVD. And from that standpoint, point, from that uh, background, and from that uh, position, I proclaim the good news. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think so concern, uh, that's, uh, uh, that, that also valid, but uh, concerning about the good news, we will proclaim the good news no matter what. And you also mentioned about witnessing, but in this case, the digital age is the Aropagos where we proclaim. But on the other hand, on the other hand, cannot deny that. Uh, and also in responding to Yon, uh, talking about the students using social media, also they have to be aware that their privacy could be invaded, no doubt. Uh, invaded, no doubt. However, you can see it. Uh, if you know why you go to the social media, and so concerning about me, my privacy as a father or at an SVD, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. And also, since you bring up that topic, I can also I, I use Paul at the end of the account in Acts chapter 17. At the end, Paul, after preaching the new to the people, uh, and then at the end, he was rejected by the people in Aropeus. Some of the people, after hearing 
that the Pope proclaimed the resurrection of the dead, they say, okay, that's it. We, we don't want, we may hear that, that topic at another time. So in this case, I can also say that um, if whatever happened to me or to us as a proclaimer on the digital age, still, if we are turned out or rejected, it's okay for us to be humble and quietly withdraw and wait for another chance to sow the seed into the field. Thank you. I hope um, that can... Yes, yeah. yes, yes. That's, that, was, that was a brilliant response, uh, Michael. Thank you. Uh, any more questions from our participants? Before Hello. We... <laughs> yes. Before we wind down for the evening. But uh, this has been a brilliant, brilliant conversation, Michael. Thank you for taking all the trouble to travel all the way to the city so that, that you are able to be, be presented the idea of recording the on the Zoom and then playing it live. But then you made it a point to travel all the way from Good Shepherd Seminary to the to Mount Hagen to, to be going live. And, mm. and thanks be to God, it was, uh, you were also, yeah. we had a little bit of a breakups, but it was, in general, it was fine. Huh? Mm. It's really worth the effort. And the whole session has been recorded. So I just want to, so thank you once again, Michael. And uh, our final and last presentation on this series, Mission and Dialogue Today, would be on the 13th of November um, by Father uh, Tien Nguyen. Uh, so that will be happening on the 13th of November on Monday from 7.30 uh, till 9 o'clock in the evening. I just want to, um, end the session by sharing the screen once again. And so this is something that we are having a mission day presentation on uh, we're having a mission day event on this Saturday, the 7th of October. Um, so we have Bishop Vincent Long, Sister Patricia Fox and Reverend Dorothy Lee who will be the parts the main speakers for the mission day followed by a multicultural mass and multicultural shared meal and program at Dorish Mara College. If you are in Melbourne, feel, please feel, feel free and invite your friends and come along for the Mission Day celebrations. And so, and when we all do this, once again, going back to the action of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will guide us in our missionary work, as time and again, Pope Francis reminds us, the main protagonist of the mission today is the Holy Spirit. And so we pray for the Universal Church as it is going to begin the Synod on Synodality on the 4th of October with all the participants from all over the world that we have a church which is a I would say a, a healthy church, a church that the people of God wants today, which is passionate, having the fire in the hearts and feet on the move with passion for mission. And so again, dialogue is the first step in the process of prophetic dialogue. We dialogue together to discern and pray and contemplate together in order to discover what prophetic action the Spirit is up to. It may mean that we may need to engage in the practice of dialogue. And the three aspects of dialogue and types of dialogue that Michael has mentioned today, dialogue of life, dialogue of action, dialogue of theological exchange, and dialogue of theological experience, four types of dialogue. Or it may mean finding the ways to preach or imagine Christ in particular context and cultures, imagining new ways of using the internet and social media, or even it might mean offering words and actions of hope, perhaps also with people of other faiths and people who have no faiths, to people in near despair. Or perhaps it may mean mission today to make sure people are receiving truthful information. For example, about the forthcoming referendum here in Australia. Or it might even mean standing up for justice, 
standing up against injustice and greed, working for a more equitable distribution of resources and the care of creation. And so with that note, we end this webinar uh, this evening. Once again, a big thanks to you, Michael. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, there are one or two chats have come up. Okay, very interesting. Try to find good connection to speak. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, so thank special, you. special thanks from all the participants tonight. Okay, thanks again, Michael. And thanks, mm -hmm. everyone. Let's continue to keep the fire for and passion for mission alive in our hearts. All right. All the very uh, best. God bless. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Abano, for being a facilitator and a respondent for tonight. And sorry for the inconvenient because of the time zone Thank change. But so that's still, why you see uh, we are kind of uh, confused. He still, he still made it, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but good to see you all of the familiar faces from Australia, especially all the sisters. Take care, and then we'll see you when I have a chance going to Australia. Thank you. And of course, thank you, the Good Shepherd Seminary. I see many faces of the faculty, the lecturer also being online to support me. Okay, greeting from uh, Mahagan to Australia and to Vietnam and to also to my school, Good Shepherd Seminary. If you have a chance, come to PNG. Yes. We will welcome you. Sure. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.